Hi everyone, welcome to our presentation of how important emotional intelligence is in respect to business and strategy. Our group members are Michael Devine, Nick Nowaki, Jesse Taylor, and myself, Fatty Elias. The following definition is what most researchers have used in their works, research papers, consulting advices, and lectures. Emotional intelligence is the capacity to reason about emotions and of emotions to enhance thinking. It includes the abilities to accurately perceive emotions, to assess and generate emotions so as to assist thought, to understand emotions and emotional knowledge, and to reflectively regulate emotions so as to promote emotional and intellectual growth. So why is this important? Research suggests that higher levels of emotional intelligence correspond to stronger job performance across a wide range of professions. The positive correlation is even noted among executives, as firms led by CEOs possessing higher relative emotional intelligence tend to outperform competitors run by executives with lower emotional intelligence. Unfortunately, the existing research also reflects a negative relationship between levels of emotional intelligence and higher rungs of the corporate ladder which is to say that higher up in a corporation you look, the less likely you are to find high levels of emotional intelligence. To better understand emotional intelligence, our casebook focuses on five elements, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. Our presentation will follow the same outline, beginning in each area with a summary of the component and then expanding to include recent scholarly developments. Number one, self-awareness. The first component of emotional intelligence that we'll discuss is self-awareness. Self-awareness requires we cultivate a deep understanding of our emotions, strengths, weaknesses, and drives. Though there are various definitions of self-awareness, we're going to focus today on the two-pronged definition proposed by Tasha Yurik in her article, What Self-Awareness Really Is and How to Cultivate It, published just this past January 2018 by the Harvard Business Review. In her January 2018 article, Dr. Yurik defined internal self-awareness as how clearly we see our own values, passions, aspirations, fit in our environment, reactions, including thoughts, feelings, behaviors, strengths, and weaknesses, and our impact on others. Dr. Yurik summarized available research as associating higher levels of internal self-awareness with higher job and relationship satisfaction, personal and social control, and happiness. Dr. Yurik also noted an inverse relationship between higher level of internal self-awareness and anxiety, stress, and depression. External self-awareness, in contrast, is an understanding of how others see us, though with reference to the same factors we listed for internal self-awareness. For example, values, passions, aspirations, fit, etc. Dr. Yurik concluded from her research that people who know how others see them are more skilled at showing empathy and taking others' perspectives. For business leaders who are able to see themselves in their, as their employees do, they tend to have better relationships with those employees. The employees tend to feel more satisfied with their leaders and see them as generally more effective. And fortunately, research shows that self-awareness can be enhanced by incorporating three easy practices into our lives. The first practice is adopting a daily mindfulness practice. Research published in Nature and Neuroscience found that a short daily mindfulness practice leads to changes in the structure and function of the brain in areas related to self-awareness. A 2018 article in the Harvard Business Review also reported findings that as little as 10 minutes a day of mindfulness training over a five-week period correspond with self-awareness increase of up to 35 percent. Best of all, you don't have to be an expert in meditation to get started as numerous apps are available for Android and iOS designed to guide mindfulness practice, such as, for example, Headspace, Calm, and the Mindfulness app. Number two, the second practice is to take regular awareness breaks. An awareness break involves doing absolutely nothing. You don't check your phone, you don't check social media, you don't check email. You disconnect from whatever you're doing for a solid two to five minutes and find a mean, mindless task, such as staring out the window or taking a short walk down the hallway. 
taking these regular short breaks or even such for even such short durations can help pull us out of habitual thinking and behavior and provides a space for self-awareness to arise. The last practice is conscientiously focusing on what a speaker is saying. When we're busy, our brains default to pattern recognition. Accordingly, when someone is speaking with us, we tend to seek out what we've heard before and are less likely to focus on the new information. This behavior is problematic and inhibits the recognition and internalization of important new information, as well as the concerns and opinions of the person we're speaking with. To avoid the brain's default pattern recognition, make an effort to focus completely on the speaker. Suppress the desire to interject unnecessarily and ignore thoughts that may distract you from the speaker. The second component is self-regulation. As self-awareness makes us recognize our emotions, the self-regulation makes us control them. The ability of managing and controlling our emotions allows us to keep the negative feelings and disruptive impulses under control dealing with stress, and channel positive and negative emotions productively. Other self-regulation competencies like showing integrity, adapting, and optimism are important. Showing integrity is a way that allows us to align actions with goals through honesty and dependability. Adapting allows us to be flexible in accepting change and overcoming obstacles. Optimism allows us to see the positive side of things, it keeps us motivated as well. The third element of emotional intelligence is motivation, which is associated with passion for the work, desire to raise the bar, and commitment along with optimism. So what is motivation? It's what pushes us to achieve our goals, feel more fulfilled, and to improve overall quality of life. Daniel Goleman, a psychologist, science journalist, and the author of the book, Emotional Intelligence, defines motivation as a variety of self-management whereby we mobilize our positive emotions to drive us towards our goals. Motivated leaders are driven to achieve beyond our expectations, their own and everyone else's. He also defines four main elements of motivation. Personal drive, which is the desire to improve or meet certain standards. Commitment, personal or organizational goals. Initiative, which is our readiness to act on opportunities. And optimism, which is the ability to keep going despite the setbacks. There are two main types of factors that motivate people. External, which is because we have to, to make money or to get good grades. And internal, which is because we want to, because we're interested and it's a personal challenge. Leaders are driven by the internal factors. First is the passion for work, innovation and creative thinking with new approaches. There is the interest, enjoyment, and satisfaction in the work itself. They also have the want to do bigger things, not just because they want more money or the recognition. Next is raising the bar. They like a challenge and they ask to be challenged. They don't want the goals that are too easy to achieve. And lastly is optimism and commitment. The ability to see the opportunity even when it first seems like a failure. Positive outlooks lead to positive emotions, increasing performance and loyalty. This attitude can shape the people around you. Such emotional cognitation has been extensively studied by Sigal Barside at the Wharton School of Management. In a recent Harvard Business Review, Dr. Barside and a colleague detail how leaders' emotions can create a positive emotional culture and enhanced performance. Research finds that the most successful entrepreneurs have a realistic sense of optimism based on the strengths they know and their outfit they have. The fourth element of emotional intelligence is empathy. Empathy is the easiest component of EI to recognize, as we've all recognized sensitivity in a friend or a loved one. It is also, however, the most difficult to define in a business sense. Empathy is not the embodiment of others' emotions and trying to please everyone. That is impossible. Empathy, as an organizational definition, is being thoughtful in your consideration and others' feelings, amid other factors and driving intelligent business decisions. There are three distinct types of empathy. Cognitive empathy, which is the ability to understand another person's perspective. Then we have emotional empathy, which is the ability to feel what someone else feels. And lastly, we have empathic concern, which is the ability to sense what other person needs from you. Cognitive empathy enables you to explain yourself in ways that will resonate with others, a skill essential to getting the best performance from direct reports. 
It requires you to think about feelings rather than feel them directly. Cognitive empathy is an outgrowth of self-awareness. The same circuits that allow you to look at your own thoughts and monitor the feelings that flow from them help you do the same for other people's thoughts and feelings. Emotional empathy springs from the parts of the brain that allow us to feel fast without thinking deeply. They mirror others' emotional states within our own bodies. When I listen to you tell a gripping story, my brain patterns literally match up with yours. This kind of empathy is important for effective mentoring, managing clients, and reading group dynamics. You can tap into emotional empathy by deliberately focusing on your own internal echoes of someone else's feelings and maintaining an open awareness of that person's face, voice, and other external signs of emotion. You may also be able to prime emotional empathy by faking it. If you act in a caring way, such as looking people in the eye and paying attention to their expressions, even when you don't particularly want to, you may start to feel more engaged. Empathic concern is closely related to emotional empathy. It's the ability to sense not just how people feel, but also what they need from you. It's what you want in your doctor or your spouse, and even your boss. Empathic concern is double-edged. You feel other people's distress intuitively and quickly, but then you deliberately weigh how much you value their well-being because you don't want to be flooded by other people's emotions. It's a tricky balance. Sometimes you need to distance yourself from others in order to stay calm and help them. The more distracted you are, the less you can cultivate the subtler forms of empathy and compassion. The fifth component is social skill. Social skill is a component where we apply all the other four components that were addressed earlier. Actually, it is a complex set of skills like building up multiple circles of acquaintances and finding common grounds with them. In other words, establishing different networks ready for action when needed. This only happens through emotional understanding of self and others' feelings. Another related skill is motivation, but the most important one, in my opinion, is listening. Physically, aren't we all created with two ears and one mouth? Think about that. How many of us get the feeling of telling their boss to shut up and listen? I'm quite sure many of us at some point wanted to do that, yet we never do. But my point is that listening is a very important skill to have. And that's why our book and many other emotional intelligence articles and studies focus on the importance of listening. Sabina Nawaz, who is a CEO coach, wrote in one of her articles that we listen so we can jump in with our perspective, or we are worried we will forget what we wanted to say if we listen for too long. We focus on our own communication rather than listening to understand others. For learning more about the importance of developing active listening skills, you may refer to the writings of Ralph Nichols, Etal Jinsu, Etal, among others. They all wrote about the same topic. Nichols mentioned that the most basic of all human needs is the need to understand and be understood. The best to understand people is to listen to them. Studies also show a strong link between emotional intelligence and bottom line results. And no, It isn't really about capitulation or being emotional in a sappy sense all the time. Rather, it's a function of excellent communication, general people skills, and using EI to shape a positive, authentic, and engaging organizational culture. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. This is where things get a little empirical. Pepsi, the renowned beverage and food giant, has made a deliberate effort in recent years to invest in EI for its leadership team, as well they should. Pepsi learned that its executives and leaders who have high EQs generated 10% more productivity. Moreover, they had 87% less turnover, brought 3.75 million more in value to the company, and increased ROI by a staggering 1,000%. Well, I'm not sure of the specific methodologies used, this is consistent with leading EI research. In another example, salespeople with high EQ from French cosmetics company L'Oreal brought in, on average, 91000 more each in additional revenue for a combined total of $2.6 million. And to think, these are just two examples. While emotional intelligence is a great concept for leaders, however, it isn't without certain anomalies. One of the most glaring points to illustrate this is EQ amongst C-suite leaders. As we have learned, Those individuals at the helm of the most successful companies tend to have high levels of EQ. 
the most logical extension of this would be that EQ is higher for those at the highest rungs of leadership. This, however, is not the case. In fact, CEOs, on average, have the lowest EQ scores in their company. Here's the gist. EQ tends to increase between the individual contributor level and through middle management. This may be because leadership higher in the organization wants the majority of direct leadership to be done with people who embody the five elements of the I. In essence, leaders need to be people whom others want to work for. Once titles move towards the director level and beyond, EQ scores tend to plummet. Now, why? The thought is that the higher in the organizational leadership hierarchy, the more companies look towards metrics and bottom line indicators to make hiring and promotion decisions. Promoting someone based on the achievement of recent monetary goals, or worse, company or industry knowledge and tenure, does not lend to advancing well-rounded leaders. Furthermore, once in the leadership role, these individuals face challenges that erode EQ. The good news is that, once again, EI is learnable. In all, it takes an enormous commitment and tremendous amount of work to foster and encourage emotional intelligence. It's much harder to develop empathy than to learn regression analysis, for example but the benefits of emotional intelligence more than repay the effort. That's why for today's business leaders, this quality is not a nice to have, it's a need to have that makes for star performance. And now we'll be more